afternoon to everyone that is joining us live. The awesome people physically at the Institute of International Relations right here in St. Augustine um, in Trinidad and Tobago. But there are many of us who are connecting remotely uh, to this, I would say, really important discussion. The Caribbean community is turning 50. Caribbean community marking 50 years of existence. I think it's a cause of celebration, I'd say so. But why? why? Why should we celebrate? And what does it mean to the next generation? Or even I would say this generation of leaders, what does it mean to future generations, period? How do we rise to the challenge? How do we leverage our talent for national and regional development? Notice, I say national and regional development. That kind of ethos that speaks to out of many one people. You're joining us here today and we're very, very pleased to have you with us. Uh, a reminder throughout the entire proceedings today, um, questions are always welcome. Uh, my name is Carol Niles, Dr. Carol Niles. I am a lecturer at the Institute of International Relations, specializing in climate policy and climate change law. So I teach a, a course on climate law and policy right here with an emphasis on small and developing states. I also teach international economic law as well, um, right here at the Institute of International Relations. And I'm also spearheading the university's effort to launch its own MSc in climate studies across all five campuses, right? Um, very, very passionate about that issue as it relates to the Caribbean, but equally as passionate about regional development. And this conversation today really excites me um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a bit of a breakdown, a bit of a breakdown in terms of what to expect today. We're gonna have a really lively discussion. Uh, again, you are invited to put your questions in the chat. Those questions will be relayed to me. Um, and we will start off with a welcome. We have a keynote speaker that I'm excited to introduce as well. Um, and then we have a, a really engaging panel that has a lot to say. Every panelist is going to speak for exactly seven minutes. At six and a half minutes, I'm going to nudge that panelist. So I can I can tell you, um, members in, of the audience, don't worry, I'll be keeping track of the time in terms of the panelists' uh, contributions. But the reason why I'm doing that is so we have more time for a discussion after. Um, so I really want, I'm putting some emphasis on the open discussion after so that we can have a conversation that really advances um, the interests of the Caribbean region so that we can have a meaningful conversation, not just about where we are now, but about where this region is going. So with that said, I'd like to call on the, the interim director of the Institute of International Relations, Dr. Anita Montut, a trusted colleague, to welcome everyone. Dr. Montut. Thank you, Chair. The Honorable Corrine James, Minister for Climate Resilience, the Environment, and Renewable Energy, Government of Grenada, and keynote speaker of this youth, youth forum. Senior executives of the CARICOM Secretariat, Dr. Jacqueline Laguardia Martinez, Senior Lecturer and Faculty Lead for this event. Dr. Karen Niles, Lecturer of the IAR and Chair of this afternoon's event. Distinguished speakers, Ms. Rene Atwell, Dean CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, Mr. Kendall Venson, Chairperson, Caribbean Regional Youth Council. Mr. Osazi Moraldo Boeing, President, UE Cavill Guild of Students. Mrs. Christine McCann, Regional President, Open Campus Guild of Students. Ms. Camilla Andriago, President, UE St. Augustine Model UN Club. And Mr. Kyle Bisnath, Acting President, UE St. Augustine Guild of Students. Young people and students, colleagues, and members of the St. Augustine community. Other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, including members of the media, good afternoon. 
It is an honor and a pleasure to bring welcome remarks from the Institute of International Relations at this youth forum, rising to the challenge, leveraging youth talent for national and regional development in commemoration of CARICOM's 50th anniversary. CARICOM has consistently maintained that the Caribbean's youth are in the most optimal position to confront and respond to the region's most complex and pressing challenges. The Caribbean Youth Ambassadors Program, launched in 1993, aimed to raise the consciousness of the region's young people around the significance and work of CARICOM, thereby incorporating their voices and perspectives into national and regional policy development and broader regional integration initiatives. In 2000, CARICOM established a Commission on Youth Development to analyze the challenges and opportunities for youth vis-a-vis -vis the CARICOM single market and economy and to promote ideas that they well be, for their well-being, improvement, and empowerment. Youth have been identified as the main beneficiaries of the CSME and therefore the success of the CSME would depend upon CARICOM's ability to substantively expand upon initiatives to build up knowledge, skills, competences, values, and attitudes among the region's youth. As an underutilized resource in the Caribbean, youth were prioritized to play a leading role in regional development. A major outcome of the commission was the, Car the CARICOM Youth Development Action Plan, utilizing the deliberations of the commission. The action plan aimed to support the CSME through a framework designed to facilitate access to a wider range of fruitful opportunities for Caribbean youth in order to engender this deeper participation in economic and political initiatives at the national and regional levels. The plan revolves around six CARICOM youth development goals articulated to inform policy and institutional development towards specific outcomes, including resilience, safety and security, health and holistic well-being, education, economic empowerment, youth participation, government and part governance and partnerships, and culture, identity, and citizenship. At three Caribbean Youth Leaders Summit held between 2011 and 2013, the region's youth leaders declared that it was imperative that youth councils, national youth councils be set up in each Caribbean state with the aim of advancing the cause and development of youth, thereby facilitating a wider social transformation towards stronger democracies and overarching good governance. Subsequently, the Caribbean Regional Youth Council was established in 2013 as the main representative body of the National Youth Councils and was tasked with advocating for the wider regional youth development agenda. In 2017, at the opening ceremony for CARICOM Youth Ambassadors Orientation Capacity Building Workshop, it was noted that CARICOM member states were actively participating in the program and many CARICOM member and associated states, associate states had developed updated national youth policies. Further, many states had by that time established national youth councils or national youth parliaments. Today, youth participation in CARICOM's development initiatives is quite significant with young scholars and professionals leading the vanguard across a host of regional issues among them one of the region's most pressing challenges, climate change. Our gratitude goes to the CARICOM Secretariat for collaborating with us on this event. I am honored and feel privileged to have the youngest member of parliament in Grenada here today to deliver the keynote address. I am sure that this will be a source of inspiration to young people in the region. I would like to convey our deepest thanks to the minister for her presence and wish to convey our gratitude to Honorable Dickon Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada for his support. It is truly a great honor to have the major student organizations of the UE and in the region making statements here today. I look forward to hearing your perspectives. I am also grateful to the young people and all who have joined to engage in this discussion. Finally, I would like to wish you a productive and fruitful discussion and deliberations. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Dr. Montoot. I'm actually going to head hand over to Dr. Montoot again. For those of you looking at the program, you would know that Dr. Montoot is uh, going to introduce uh, our keynote speaker as well. 
But I just wanted to make sure I took the time just before she does that to just let everybody know. I know this it doesn't usually come up, um, for, but depending on what device you're on. So if you are logging in, logging in on Zoom, you can just check the chat. You will be able to access questions from the chat, um, but also the program. We put the program in the chat as well for those of you that might have missed it. All right. So um, I just want to make sure I said that before we, we dive in further into the proceedings. Again, we're very excited to have all of you here. And I'm going to hand back over to Dr. Matu to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, and so after Dr. Matu speaks, we'll go straight into the keynote speaker. And then you'll hear from me after to introduce you as the panelists. All right. How, in, I hope you all are enjoying and hand back over to Dr. Matu. It is an honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Honorable Corrine Zanel James is a level-headed, calm, and enthusiastic individual who can carry out any role professionally and effectively. Through her many years in service to her community and country, she has Hello, I think, I think they cut out. Is it just me? Or did they just cut off? I think they cut off, right? We lost connectivity, so... Okay, um... no problem. I can continue uh, the introduction so that we can move smoothly along. No problem. These things happen. All part for the course. Um, just give me one moment, ladies and gentlemen, so I can restore the... Okay, here we go. So thanks for that, everybody. So just continuing on from... Um, Dr. Montu, Ms. James, uh, through her many, many years of service to her community and country, she has meaningfully contributed to team success through hard work, attention to detail, and excellent organizational skills. She was born in the Paris of St. John. She holds a bachelor degree in psychology from St. George's University and an associate degree from the School of Arts, Science, and Professional Studies at the TA Mary Shaw Community College in Law, Geography, and Sociology. In 2018, she was appointed to the House of the Senate, becoming the youngest senator in the history of Grenada and the Commonwealth of Nations. There, she was more instrumental in her quest for change by supporting and reviewing laws for the betterment of her peers and country. Today, she is the youngest elected member of parliament in the history of Grenada, and the only female elected member for the winning party. She is now the Minister for Climate Resilience. And those of you that heard my introduction will know why I'm smiling. Um, she is now the Minister for Climate Resilience, the Environment and Renewable Energy in Grenada. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Miss Kareen James. Thank you so much, Dr. Niles. Um, Assistant Secretary General, Ms. Allison Drayton, Dr. Anita Montout, Dr. Karen Niles, other distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon. Today, I come before you as a proud representative of the Caribbean's future to discuss a topic of paramount importance, rising to the challenge, leveraging youth talent for national and regional development on the occasion of the commemoration of CARICOM's Golden Jubilee, where we reflect on the incredible journey and the many challenges that have shaped our region. Yet, despite the obstacles, our people have risen to the occasion time and time again, demonstrating resilience, creativity, and a deep commitment to progress. Today's topic, is not just about identifying the potential of our young people. It is about redefining the trajectory of the Caribbean community by learning from the past, embracing the present, and shaping a sustainable future. The Carib CARICOM region is at a crossroads. Our history is marked by both achievements and setbacks. We have witnessed the consequences of short-sighted decisions and the barriers to progress that hinder our growth. However, we now have the unique opportunity to learn from these experiences, to chart a new course that embraces our youth's energy, 
innovation, and resilience. But as we look to the future, we must ask ourselves, how can we best leverage this youth talent for national and regional development? How can we provide opportunities for our young people to thrive and contribute to their food potential? And how can we ensure that the next 50 years of CARICOM are even more successful and transformative than the last? These are not easy questions to answer, but they are vital ones. We must acknowledge the mistakes of our past leaders, such as inadequate investment in education and infrastructure, neglect of our environmental concerns, and the over-reliance on single industries. By recognizing these issues, we can now harness the talent and ambition of our young people to address them head on, building a foundation for sustainable development that benefits our region and the global community. As we gather here today, let us explore how this topic can empower the next generation of leaders to break free from the constraints of the past by expounding on the importance of youth development and highlighting the challenges and opportunities facing youth development. And to encourage my fellow counterparts to boldly stand upon the shoulders of some of our revolutionaries and moonshots to propel our region forward by identifying and addressing the bottlenecks that have held us back we can fast track our upward mobility and foster a more resilient, prosperous Caribbean. So let us delve into the importance of youth development. Firstly, our generation is the living embodiment of resilience, innovation, and adapt adaptability. We have grown up in a world where borders have become increasingly fluid. Technology has advanced at an unprecedented pace and the need for sustainable practices have never been more urgent. As the sons and daughters of the Caribbean, we carry the vibrant spirits of our ancestors within us, as well as the determination to forge a brighter future for our region. In the realm of technology, the future of our sustainable development in the Caribbean, our youth have access to an incredible wealth of information and resources and the ability to connect with people and ideas from around the globe. This presents us with a unique opportunity to harness technology and drive the digital transformation of our region. From artificial intelligence to renewable energy, our youth have the potential to create groundbreaking innovations that not only shape our local economies, but also contribute to the global technological landscape. Entrepreneurship is another area where our Caribbean youth can shine. Our rich cultural heritage and diverse backgrounds have given us a unique perspective that lends itself to creativity, problem solving and innovation. As a result, our young entrepreneurs are breaking barriers, creating new business models and contributing to our region's economic growth. By fostering an environment where entrepreneurial spirit thrives, we can ensure that the Caribbean continues to be a hub for innovation, job creation, and economic prosperity. Sustainable development is also a critical aspect of our future. Our region is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And it is our collective responsibility to ensure that we protect our natural resources, ecosystems, and the way of life for generations to come. Our youth are the vanguard of this movement, leading the charge toward a greener and more sustainable future. They are pushing for adopting renewable energy, advocating for preserving our environment and developing innovative solutions to our most pressing challenges. And one of the key ways these can occur is by prioritizing education and training for the 21st century. 
we must pro be provided with quality education and training programs that equip us with the knowledge and skills needed to succeed in today's rapidly changing and competitive world. This includes not only traditional academic subjects, but also vocational and technical training that prepares young people for jobs in emerging industries. Another important aspect of youth development is creating opportunities for young people to engage in meaningful and community activities. This includes volunteer work, community service, and sometimes that one thing that we tend to make our young people be afraid of, political engagement. Unfortunately, the vibrant potential of Caribbean youths remains overshadowed by the constraints of tradition and power dynamics, as limited opportunities for political engagement deprive our societies of fresh perspectives and innovative solutions. Our young minds on tapped passion and talents yearn for a brighter future, yet we are often sidelined, our voices unheard. It is a collective loss that we must that must be addressed. So the walls of inequality and indifference can no longer stifle the dreams of our youth. To develop a sense of civic responsibility and instill in us a commitment to making a positive difference in the world. Ultimately, youth development must be viewed as a long term investment in our country's and region's future. By prioritizing youth development, we can create a brighter and more prosperous future for ourselves and for future generations. I now turn your focus to the challenges facing youth development. The vibrant potential of our young minds in CARICOM is often obscured by the shadows cast by the challenges that we face. The dreams of our brilliant souls are not held back by the limitations of our imagination or the vigor of our passion, but by the lack of investment and support and economic hindrance for youth led initiatives. Our boundless creativity, coupled with an unparalleled desire to transform our communities, longs to break free from the shackles of inadequate resources and funding. We must prioritize investment in youth-led initiatives to address this challenge and create an enabling environment, supporting young people in our endeavors so that it does not leave us gasping for the breath of opportunity and forces us to abandon our ideas or pursue alternative paths that may not align with our interests and skills. This could include initiatives such as providing access to funding and resources, governments, private sector organizations and civil society groups can work together to provide young people with access to funding and resources to start and grow their initiatives. This could include grants, loans, mentorship programs and training opportunities. Another way is creating supportive networks. By creating networks of like-minded individuals and organizations, we can provide young people with access to peer support, mentorship, and opportunities to collaborate and share resources. Fostering a culture of innovation is also another way. Governments and other stakeholders can promote a culture of innovation by providing support for research and development and recognizing and celebrating the achievements of young innovators. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my final subheading, exploring opportunities for youth development. Despite the numerous challenges that our young people face, there are, in fact, abundant opportunities for them to grow and contribute positively to both national and regional development. Now more than ever is the time to invest in our future. Now is the time to develop and to do so with resilience and intelligence. It is crucial that we invest in our young people, empowering them with the skills, the knowledge and resources they need to nav navigate these turbulent times. This will not only secure their individual futures, but also ensure the long-term prosperity of our nation and region. 
Our commitment to youth development must be unyielding and all encompassing, creating an environment where our young people can thrive and succeed. Critical and creative thinking is integral to this process. By fostering a culture of innovation, curiosity, and problem solving, we can enable our young people to tackle the challenges they face head on. As a result, they will be better prepared to find creative solutions, adapt and evolve, and ultimately drive the change we need for a brighter, more prosperous future. We may not yet be where we want to be, but we have indeed come a long way. Therefore, it is high time that we forge a developmental pact, a commitment to sustainable progress and youth empowerment that should have been made years ago. I also want to underscore that transformation thrives on the amplification of impact, which suggests that as member countries collaborate and pool their resources, knowledge, and expertise, they can create a collective impact greater than the sum of their individual efforts. By working together, CARICOM countries can address shared challenges such as economic development, climate change, disaster preparedness, and regional security more effectively than they could individually. So let us take a moment to imagine a Caribbean region that is the envy of the, of, of the world, a region that is a hub of innovation, creativity, and progress, a region that is not only surviving, but thriving and forging ahead as a model for the 21st century. This is not just a dream, but a real possibility if, if we tap into our people's resource and resources immense potential. And so here are five ways we can achieve this. First, by harnessing our natural resources. With our abundant natural resources, we can focus on sustainable development and create new opportunities for economic growth, job creation, and entrepreneurship. We must embrace a blue and green economy and leverage our resources to create a more prosperous and environmentally sustainable future. We can also do so by investing in education and technology. We must invest in our youth, education systems, and technology infrastructure to create a workforce equipped with the skills and knowledge necessary to drive innovation and progress. This investment will position us as leaders in the knowledge-based economy of the 21st century. Fostering a culture of collaboration is also another area. We must look together as a region to tackle common challenges and leverage each other's strengths. By fostering a culture of collaboration, we can share knowledge and resources, build stronger partnerships and drive collective progress. Leveraging our unique cultural heritage. Our rich and diverse cultural heritage is a valuable asset that we can leverage to promote our region globally. We must embrace our cultural identity and promote it as a unique selling point, attracting tourism, investment, and opportunities for cultural exchange. Embracing innovation and creativity. We must be bold in our thinking and embrace innovation and creativity in all sectors of our society. By challenging traditional norms and embracing new ideas, we can create a more dynamic and forward-thinking Caribbean community that is a beacon of hope for the world. Here in Grenada, our Prime Minister, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, has emphasized the transformational agenda for Grenada because he understands the importance of sustainable development, inclusive growth, and empowering the nation's youth to drive lasting change. He also recognizes the, the potential of young people to become the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. He is dedicated to ensuring that they have a meaningful voice in the decision-making processes that will shape Grenada's future. 
and through his unwavering commitment, he has given us, the young people of Grenada, the opportunity to feel confident and equal at the negotiating table of our beloved country. Furthermore, Prime Minister Mitchell has demonstrated his belief in its transformative potential as a lucrative investment for our nation and the region by championing the effective rollout of the Office of Creative Affairs. I am happy to announce that between May 10 to 12, 2023, we will be hosting Grenada's premier cultural and creative industries conference entitled Unleashed an unforgettable three days of inspiration, innovation, and connection with like-minded experts and trailblazers in the creative industry, a first of its kind for Grenada. As a result of his visionary, visionary leadership, we are now more inspired than ever to unleash our creativity and contribute to a brighter, more, more prosperous future for all. Prime Minister Mitchell's steadfast dedication to empowering young talent has enriched our lives and kindled a flame of hope in our hearts, knowing that we are valued and supported by a leader who truly understands our potential. In the pursuit of a better tomorrow, we stand proudly alongside our Prime Minister, ready to rise to the challenge together. My journey Having served as the, as the youngest senator in the Commonwealth of Nations and Grenada in 2018, to becoming the youngest member of parliament and minister for climate resilience, environment and renewable energy in 2022 is a testament to the power of youth. It is a story of breaking barriers, defying expectations and demonstrating the immense potential that resides within each of us. But this is not just my story. It is a story of countless young people across the Caribbean who possess the talent, determination, and vision to make a lasting impact. It is a story that must inspire and empower us all to rise to the challenge and actively participate in regional affairs. Together, we can create a future grounded in collaboration, innovation, and sustainability. We can forge partnerships between governments, businesses, and civil societies, unlocking opportunities for growth and development. We can embrace the principles of social equity and environmental stewardship, ensuring that our progress benefits all, leaving no one behind. The task before us is both immense and urgent. As new and inspiring young leaders, we must seize this opportunity and rise to the challenge of leveraging our collective talent for the greater good. In a world where the echoes of global exchanges reverberate in the lives of these young individuals, it is crucial that we recognize and respond to their needs with urgency and empathy. Each denied opportunity is a seed of potential that withers away leaving behind a barren landscape devoid of the transformative ideas that could have shaped a better future for all of us. We must empower our young people to become agents of change, leaders who can inspire others and role models for the future generations. We must provide them with platforms to share their ideas, showcase their talents and collaborate with others to make a difference in their communities and beyond. By doing so, we can tap into the immense potential of our young people and build more inclusive, sustainable, and prosperous societies that leave no one behind and uphold the values of justice, equality, and human dignity. As we stand together on the cusp of, of a new era, let us never forget the strength, the determination, and resilience that define the Caribbean spirit. Our generation is uniquely positioned to drive change, and we must embrace our potential to create a brighter future for our region. So let us rise to the challenge, leveraging the immense talent of our youth to propel our Caribbean community forward in technology, entrepreneurship, and sustainable development. And in the words of David Rother in the Caribbean, in the West Indies National Anthem in 1993, we, and I would add, our generation are a sunbeam 
cutting through a clouded past. We can write the next chapter of our region's history, a story of hope, progress, and unity. So let us rise and let us rise together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you very much for those inspiring words. Uh, Honorable Minister, I'm gonna hand over very briefly to Dr. Mantut, who I know wants to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Niles. Honorable Minister, I'm sorry that I did not have the honor of completing my introduction due to um, connectivity and breaking transmission. So I want to say a personal thanks from me and on behalf of the Institute, I am so grateful for your presence that you have taken the time to be with us. We are very grateful. I also want to take the opportunity to convey um, our thanks and our gratitude to your Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mitchell, for his support of this event. Your address was passionate, it was inspiring, and it contained concrete proposals as to how to achieve the recommendations and the goals that you had outlined, that you have outlined. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And I pass you back, I pass it back to um, Dr. Niles to continue the program. Thank you again. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. And again, thanks again for your words, Minister James. Uh, we are going to get into the individual um, contributions of the panelists, followed by a group discussion. Uh, I want to encourage everyone. I see persons joining us here. Uh, one person with Caribbean here is joining us from uh, the UK. I see persons from Guadeloupe. I see persons uh, from all over the region here. And I want to encourage us to, as much as we can, you know, if you want, you can take off your camera. If not, you can um, just feel very free to engage, ask questions as this conversation continues. What I'd like to do actually is um, just introduce all of our panelists. And then after that, we just go from one panelist into the other. I think that will be a much smoother transition than having to stop um, after every single panelist and introduce them uh, individually. Um, I would, though, however, beg some forgiveness. Uh, some um, bios will not, did not reach me in time. So, and I, I'm also not going to read entire bios, right? Um, because that's why we have LinkedIn and the internet. I'm just going to give you a uh, uh, a good enough introduction for the, so the audience actually knows who they're speaking, who they're hearing. I think that's really, really important so we know where the information is coming from. But it was not going to be the full detailed page long um, bios because these are very, very um, qualified and distinguished persons they want to hear from. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, let's jump in. <laughs> let's jump in. So I'm going to introduce everybody um, and then we jump in. Um, we are going to begin just in case people persons are wondering. Um, the, the, as I said before, the program is in, uh, is in the chat for those of you that might have missed it before. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Miss Renee Atwell, who is an attorney and <laughs> she's an attorney at law and a Caribbean youth leader that is passionate about law, international relations and youth development. She's a public defender, and as a public defender, she is a proponent for a, rehabilitative, for a rehabilitative approach to criminal justice and the development of an effective juvenile justice system throughout the Caribbean region. She's also one of Trinidad and Tobago's CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, where she advocates for regional youth issues and youth involvement in CARICOM and the CSME. Finally, as the Dean of CARICOM's Youth Ambassador Corps. Rene sits on several CARICOM working groups and steering committees to provide a youth perspective for policy development in the region. Now, there's only one more thing about Rene I, I want to say to everyone. Rene is also the founder and director of, founder and executive director, sorry, of Girls of Impact TNT, a non-profit non organization which aims 
provide mentorship and leadership uh, training to young women across Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, uh, a, a very, very um, hard, heartfelt welcome to, to Reni. I want to tell you about Camila in Driago, um, who is the U University of West Indies and Augustine Modern United Nations president and a student at the university. She is passionate about human rights, migration issues, diplomacy and international relations. She is currently pursuing a degree in international relations and she is bilingual. She uses her language versatility to serve as an interpreter and a teacher in order to help and build others up while encouraging growth and unity. Another panelist who's joining us here today is Kendall Vincent. Uh, Kendall is a youth development and communication professional from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, passionate about the holistic development of children and youth. He's currently pursuing a BA in communications at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine, uh, with over 15 years of experience in civil leadership across the youth development sector at various levels. Uh, Kendall is a cultural lover and fuses his experience as a creative towards conceptualizing innovative strategies to engage children and youth, having seen the tremendous impact of the arts in the transformation of lives. With his vast experience, Kendall currently serves as the chairperson of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council. I'm going to stop there because I think if I do three of them, at least you all will remember the three. And then after that, I'll introduce the others. Because I think if I introduce all of them at once, people are not going to remember all of those bios. And it's some pretty impressive bios, if, if I think you all will agree. I am going to start, therefore, with Miss Atwell. Um, she's going to speak for seven minutes. And I'm going to start and kind of we move right on to Miss Andriago. And then we're going to move right on to Mr. Vincent. So we're going to go in that order. Um, Miss Atwell, we'll begin with you. Welcome. Young people must have their voices heard at all times. We cannot be passive participants in the conversations about our future. We must get active and create the future the way we want it. Idem Agbana. Distinguished keynote speaker, CARICOM executives, faculty of the Institute of International Relations, young people, speakers, members of the media, good afternoon. I am quite elated today to bring some brief remarks on behalf of the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Program, which is the community's mechanism for youth participation in the integration movement. Now, in a region where approximately 60% of the citizenry is classified as youth that is under the age of 30, there is no doubt that active youth participation is integral to the success of CARICOM. And I highlight the term active because we understand and appreciate that tokenistic approaches to youth inclusion have been adopted by decision makers, not only within the Caribbean, but worldwide. Young people continue to be excluded from planning, implementing, and the monitoring and evaluation of policies and programs that directly affect us. The potential of youth remains untapped while we boast of innovation and creativity and an unparalleled enthusiasm to create a better and more sustainable world. As many of you may be aware, CARICOM established its Youth Ambassador Program in 1993 at the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Chagramas. And while the program has undergone significant changes since its inception, its main aim remains to facilitate youth participation and partnership in regional integration processes. All in all, CARICOM really hopes that young people throughout the region would understand the importance of the integration movement and would meaningfully participate in it to develop a sense of Caribbean identity and pride. However, despite the CARICOM Youth Ambassador Program, the reality is that there is still a large cross-section of youth within the region that are unaware of CARICOM and that are not actively involved in the integration movement. Now, the report of the CARICOM Commission on Youth Development in 2010 would have highlighted that young people are an underutilized resource for the development of the Caribbean region. It was argued that young people were best positioned by virtue of their creativity to respond to the demands of integration on the CSM. However, despite the efforts that were being made, young people continue to lack knowledge about CARICOM and the CSME, 
They continue to be plagued by issues such as unemployment and crime and violence. And of course, they are confronted with the challenges of minimum opportunities to participate in governance structures. And it's quite disheartening that in 2023, over 10 years later, these problems continue to plague the region. So what can CARICOM do to promote youth participation and engagement in Caribbean regionalism? And on the converse, what can Caribbean youth do to participate and engage in CARICOM's work? Of course, awareness and public education remains part of paramount importance, but not just general public education. There must be youth-friendly opportunities for young persons to be kept updated and informed of regional policies, programs, and opportunities for youth engagement. There must be outreach initiatives at schools and other environments where young people frequent. Of course, CARICOM must also provide opportunities for youth to participate in regional organizations and processes. For example, attending the Heads of Government Conference where they can see how community decisions are being made. Further opportunities to participate, for example, in the planning of various regional conferences and symposiums on areas that are of critical importance to the sustainable development of the Caribbean region. Caribbean region, sorry. Young people must continue to be provided with opportunities to sit on steering committees and technical working groups to contribute to regional policy making. However, despite this, it is important to note that youth engagement in Caribbean regionalism remains a dual responsibility. While CARICOM has a heavy responsibility, youth can also take action to boldly participate in regionalism and to demand action from their leaders to participate in the integration movement. Of course, a multifaceted approach must be adopted. This includes, for example, capacity building, where young people can demand from their leaders to be provided with resources and training opportunities such as workshops and seminars that, develop, that focuses, sorry, on leadership advocacy and negotiation to assist them in actively participating in the integration processes. Of course, there is also a promotion of cultural exchange. Young people can participate, for example, in cultural events and festivals across the region where they have the opportunity to learn about other cultures and also share their cultures with others, making friends and networks throughout the region. There must also be on the part of young people advocacy for policy that prioritizes young people being engaged in making decisions sorry, at both the national and regional levels. There must be calls for youth parliaments and youth advisory boards that allow young persons to have a say in the decisions that affect us. As young people living and working within the region, we will have expectations of regionalism. We, of course, can expect opportunities to come out of collaboration and partnership between Caribbean countries, but there are also a number of challenges that confront us. For example, we can expect that there will be cultural exchange and a certain level of diversity by persons throughout the region working together and learning about various cultures, and this will assist us in being able to develop a sense of Caribbean identity and pride. Of course, we know that through the CSME, there can be increased economic opportunities where young persons have the opportunity to work and to move throughout the region. And all in all, young people being that very important asset for Caribbean development means that Caribbean governments must invest in youth. Investment in education and skills development is of critical importance. Not only formal education, but there must be investment in vocational training and lifelong opportunities. Mentorship opportunities, for example, must be created and provided for young professionals within the region so that they can contribute positively to the development of the Caribbean region. I know that time is against me, so I will conclude. Young people represent a valuable asset to Caribbean development and regionalism. However, there remains an untapped potential in terms of how they are able to contribute to and participate in Caribbean regionalism. As the Honorable Minister would have alluded to earlier, we have accomplished a lot. However, as we move forward, more must be done to ensure that young people can actively participate within CARICOM and its integration processes. I do look forward to hearing what my other colleagues have to say so that the appropriate recommendations can be made to ensure young people are meaningfully engaged in the integration movement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Ndriago. Hello, so I would have brought a presentation with me. I don't know if it can be seen or shared. 
Uh, in the meantime, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Camila Indriago. I am the president of the Model United Nations Club here in UE St. Augustine. Who are we? Is a club that promotes advocacy, diplomacy, and youth engagement. We aim for the youth to engage in the UN agenda and exercise debate and the diplomatic skills in an intercultural environment. For those who are not familiar with how a model UN works, uh, it is an environment where we do a simulation of the uh, General Assembly or other bodies of the UN, where we uh, give topics of interest for the young people and we aim for them to discuss them. Uh, while adopting the policies and the personality of different countries across the globe. Now on to slide four, why is Model UN important? It's because Model UN promotes advocacy, it promotes human rights, it promotes youth going forward, involving themselves in the international arena, in an environment not familiar to them, where they can shine the brightest, by understanding the policies and the processes of other countries. Now, onto the next slide, which is really the main point of importance of us being here today, is Caribbean regionalism and youth expectations. What the youth most widely would agree expects from CARICOM and integration at a regional uh, stage is improved economic opportunities investment, growth, trade agreements that allows for the economy to thrive, access to education and training, or more so, more dynamic, diverse, and better education and training, improved mobility across borders, so the opportunity to visit, to be in different countries within the Caribbean region without uh, gruesome or lengthy paperwork or visa or migration requirements, greater political unity, without the division of party politics, without the division of cultural and identity uh, disagreements that we might have and it in turn increase our cultural exchange to be more empathetic, to be able to learn more from one another. Now onto the next slide. What are the youth expectations for CARICOM? So we have in common, in our expectations and CARICOM expectations and goals, the increased uh, employment opportunities. So the increased of employment opportunities for professionals across the Caribbean. We have in common the improved access to education and training. We all want better professionals. We want bright professionals. We want people who stay in here and improve our place, our Caribbean, our regional arena. We want support from entrepreneurs. Young people these days, they are thinking in diversifiable ways, in many different ways outside of the box to look for businesses and areas that we had not looked into exploiting before. This includes also the recognition of professional credentials. Why must it be a lengthy process to be recognized as a professional with a degree of study in different places in the Caribbean when we are the same Caribbean? And then the increase investment in technology and innovation. Uh, it is my understanding that the World Bank would have made a small project uh, circa 2022 maybe was when the last report was released with small island states that had not had the opportunity of better internet facilities. And the improvement was incredible in the youth where more knowledge banks, where more platforms were provided, they thrived on knowledge on curiosity, research, and learning. On to the next slide, please. How do we have the promotion of youth participation and engagement? It is a real concern that the youth or kids these days, as they may say, are not really thinking of the Caribbean or regional integration or regionalism. How do we make them interested again? Theory of motivation suggests we take them into account. So we're taking them into account, but then we create an environment for them to thrive. So we focus on sustainability and human rights, timely issues affecting our generation, our generation that needs carry the burdens of the past generations, that needs enshrined the Paris Agreement. 
Okay, uh, it was in the words of the Barbados Prime Minister, the Honorable Ms. Ian Motley, that two degrees of global warming is death sentence. These are the things that affect the youth and therefore the things that they're interested in, human rights, migration, cross-border interactions, uh, and of course, um, humanitarian issues, all things very relevant to us. We have the investing in digital infrastructure, so the platforms that we use, how do we diversify them? How do we bring them into a digital world that is more dynamic, more accessible for the youth and a fostering a culture of innovation and creativity? It is true and it is said very often that uh, innovation does not equal progress. However, this generation is the one carrying forward the thoughts and goals that we all have in common the goals of sustainability, of great you know, betterment of our political and economic areas. Innovation is what this generation thrives off of. This is what we can offer, attract it to them, that will in turn give us progress. Finally, we expand our thoughts outside the Caribbean borders, not to promote brain drain and not to promote uh, you know, anti-patriotic or nationalistic thoughts, but to show the youth how others might be able to expand, take example and better it in our region. Next slide, please. So for us, for my peers, for the youth, how do you enhance regionalism and engagement with CARCOM work? Firstly, be involved and passionate. Be interested, be knowledgeable, be present. Understand the world you're living in and try to better it. Secondly, find interest and pride in identity. A Caribbean identity, a diverse identity is something that you should be prideful of, something that you should, you should hold dear to you. In the words of D.S. Napo, we make ourselves according to the ideas we have of our possibilities. Just think of the possibilities in here that can move us forward. Let's follow the SDG agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. If you have no idea where to start, this is always a good start to promote sustainable development goals for the climate, for infrastructures, for social change, for gender equality, for health for all. And finally, educate yourself and research. With all the improved platforms, technology provided, educate yourself and research. All of these things are also given to students as options and realities in Model United Nations. And it is imperative that we take place in platforms and clubs and activities that enshrine and empower us to the future. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very, very much for your words. Um, we move right along to Mr. Vincent that I introduced you earlier. Please, the floor is yours, Mr. Vincent. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me take this opportunity, of course, to first and foremost say happy anniversary to CARICOM celebrating its 50th anniversary um, this year. Um, let me take the opportunity as well to extend uh, warm gratitude, of course, to the Institute of International Relations for extending this opportunity um, to present here um, this afternoon. Um, it gives me great pleasure, um, of course, to sit here and be part of this conversation um, surrounding the role of youth and how we can leverage those talents towards, you know, national development and of course regional developments one of the things do i represent an organization by the name of the caribbean regional youth council um shortly known as crick and of course um dr mutut who i pronounce that name correctly um would have indicated or spoke towards the um how we would have came about as an organization essentially recognizing the need um for the importance for young persons to coalesce um 
through um, their national youth councils at their country level. And eventually we at the Caribbean Regional Youth Council would feed into that regional representation. Simply put, our organization, the rule of our organization is really to sort of be that engine room to amplify the voice of youth um, and youth issues um, across the um, Caribbean. Um, one of the things do I just want to see um do one of the things do recently the Caribbean Regional Youth Council we would have recently concluded our seven Caribbean Youth Leaders Summit which took place from the twelfth to the fifteenth of January um and that took place in Tobago um and we would have you know identified the team adding global value taking charge of our future and essentially what that means and I um really thought it as important to add to this conversation is that we as young persons have to be able to not just see ourselves in our immediate spaces but recognize our value um, and that be extends not just nationally um, but regionally and of course um, to the globe um, and further to that in terms of being able to take charge of our future and what that essentially means or states is that we're not just sitting um, you know as bystanders, um, but we're actively playing a role in terms of shaping this future um, that we want to see or that we want to live in. Um, I know that this very is a catchphrase normally to hear the terminology, youth is a future. I would like to deviate a bit from that and simply say that youth are not just the, not the future, but youth are the now. And I want young persons or persons who, not just youth, but youth stakeholders to not just recognize young persons as, you know, um, the future, but also engage them. Um, I know quite a couple um the two presenters that would have gone before me, as well as the Honourable Minister, would have stated quite a bit um, in terms of, I, you know, I feel like what else is there um, to see um, in terms of what youths um, need. So we see young people, I just want to briefly state that we see young people, young people are often on the front lines of development challenges. Our potential to aid in development remains underutilized, underestimated, and understated. While the COVID-19 pandemic, however, has undoubtedly stymied the regional development goals, the crisis has provided us with a unique opportunity for young people to take charge and play a greater role in charting uh, the region's future. So essentially, um, one of the things do I just want to um, just sort of add or focus my presentation around some key um, areas. As young people, what are our expectations? We want to be able to, we want to start by being able to shift the narrative um, our expectations of shifting that narrative of seeing young persons as problem makers or, you know, when we see, when we look at the media, we see a lot of negative things are propagated about our young persons. However, we want to sort of shift that narrative and see young people are actively doing positive things in their communities and their different spaces. So we want to amplify those messages um, as compared to promoting all the negative things. So we need to shift the narrative of how we look at youth. We also, in shifting that narrative, we need to start seeing youth as co-creators and not um, just active bystanders. And co-creators, meaning that we actively collaborate and engage young persons, um, not just in forums like these, but um, giving young people, and I say kudos to the government of Grenada um, for you know having young persons such as yourself serve um, the minister, serve in these capacities. So um, I know youth and active political participation is something that we sort of shy away from. Um, but it's important for us and the us as stakeholders across the board to see youth as co-creators in their development. So what essentially is our, when we talk about CARICOM and um, it's something that, you know, I've always been, I always consider myself a regionalist in the concept of, um, when we talk about CARICOM, what are the, what is our expectations of CARICOM as young people? And we want CARICOM, a lot of young persons, you know, for some of us who have the opportunity to sit in these rooms and sit in these spaces may understand CARICOM, what is its mandate, what is it, um, what is it about. But there's also a wider audience beyond us who, young people who sit, um, um, Rennie would have indicated in her presentation, that young people are come for close to 60% of the um, population and there's a wider grouping of persons that do not know about CARICOM and therefore I think it's important especially at the 50 years um, at this point that you know we all actively play a role in more kind of 
promoting CARICOM. Um, so there has to be our expectation as well as that there should be increased knowledge sharing about CARICOM, the role of CARICOM and the role of young people in shaping CARICOM um, going forward. We want to look at in terms of one of the things that I want, and it would be remiss of me not to mention, since this is my immediate constituent, the National Youth Councils. We in the Caribbean region, no, in the, within the Caribbean sphere, at present, we only have roughly seven um, National Youth Councils. And then there's in Trinidad, we have the Tobago Youth Council and the Trinidad Youth Council. Um, and therefore, even within um, those seven um, or eight National Youth Councils, there are some challenges there. We get a lot of complaints about, you know, either they don't feel involved, they don't feel engaged in the decision making. And there are different issues. But my role here today is not to focus on those issues. Um, however, to one, um, ask, um, using the platform of CARICOM um, to sort of advocate for more, um, we want to see national youth councils across the Caribbean, recognizing national youth councils as independent bodies that represent young persons, the collective interests of um, young persons within the country. And it's something that, you know, we have been, we at the Caribbean Regional Youth Council have been engaging um, various stakeholders surrounding um you know, the development of national youth councils. So places such as Grenada, Suriname, some of these countries do not necessarily, do not have an active or do not have a national youth council. Um, places such as St. Vincent, they would have had a youth council before, and then I think it would have gone into some dormancy. Um, so we want to um, sort of, I want to use this platform. One of the things that CARICOM can do is implore um, or encourage um the governments um, to ensure that they support and actively play a role in terms of strengthening national youth councils where they exist and also creating national youth councils in countries um, where they are not. And the importance of national youth councils is really that opportunity to sort of provide that coordinated approach and that one voice. Um, we talk about partnerships, we talk about collaborations, and therefore that can be channeled through that um, national um, youth councils, um, as well as we, that's one of the areas. So I just want to use this opportunity to suggest that that is one of our expectations of CARICOM um, from our level. We, some of the suggestions. Kendall, just, just giving you the, the heads up that you have about 30 more seconds, okay? We'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, that's we'll go ahead, yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, let me see, um, first and foremost, this is a conversation that we're having. It is an ongoing um, conversation, but I want to see that it's very important that, you know, we recognize, I think all of us in the room here, this is a con. my colleagues before would have explashed or said most of the things that I had written down. So there's really not much left for me to say, but to say that we should always continue to not just have young people at the table, but how do we, after today, after the conversation that we're having here today, how are we all individually in our very own spaces, giving young people the attention and the respect that they deserve. Um, so without further ado, I would want to hand it back over to you, um, to Niles. Um, and then I guess we will take it from here. Thank you for the opportunity. Not a problem at all. I am enjoying this immensely. Um, I, I, I'm in my agree. I mean, I guess I should say for the sake of full disclosure, um, let somebody out me later on. I am a, I'm a youth worker and I have been a youth worker for about two decades. Um, so this, I am in my, I'm in my weekly here. I'm really enjoying this. We are going to move on to have, um, Miss Chris. I'm going to have the next three speakers now, um, in the following order. We're going to have, um, Miss Christine McCann, who is a Jamaican living with her husband in the Turks and Caicos. Uh, she has over 15 years of directing managing experience and is a former manager, customer service and super, supervisory management trainer and event planner. Her main strength is communication and commitment to building solid relationships with people. She's a natural leader and developer of people. She believes in giving back and is an active um, and motivated volunteer. It just um, two more things that I, I would say. Um, one, in her younger years, uh, as she put it, I'm not saying that in her younger years, she actually put in her own bio, in her younger years, she was a 100 to 200 meter sprinter and she enjoyed and played many other sports such as golf and netball and did some martial arts as well. And it was a five time ladies champion skeet shooter. 
As a past athlete, she encourages a healthy lifestyle, including staying fit uh, to support the body. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to her contribution. Um, next, the, the person that's going to talk after her is, and please, please um, forgive me if my pronunciation is not 100% correct, but I have been trying um, uh, Mr. Ozaze Moraldo Bowen uh, is the president of the UE Guild of Students. Um, I also believe that um, Mr. Bowen is study. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have it. I actually have a, a note here. You know, it's in the corporate and investment banking. I believe he's at CIBC First Caribbean International Bank as well, and doing an MSc in finance. Um, I also know that he's a, he would tell you what, what it means to be a saint. Uh, he knows what I mean by that. Um, I know I, that that's also something on his profile, but also um, he is based at the UE Careful campus and is UE Guild president there. The last person that I need to introduce is Mr. Kyle Bisner, who is the vice president of the Guild of Students at the St. Augustine campus, which again, to avoid anybody saying, Anything afterwards, I'll say it for myself. That is a position that I formerly hold, held, um, and it's also close to my heart. So um, I know he's not acting president of, of the Guild of Students, but I know he was vice president before, which was the position I held. Um, so, I mean, obviously, no partiality towards the position, but I am looking forward to what all of them have to say. So, in the order that I, I introduce them, I'm going to start with Ms. Christine McCann. Then go to Mr. Moraldo Bowen, then go to Mr. Bisner. So, without any further ado, please allow me to hand over to Mrs. McCann. Thank you, Dr. Niles. Good day and a happy 50th to CARICOM and a warm welcome to the from the University of the West Indies Open Campus, Guild of Students, to the Institute of International Relations and esteemed members fellow panelists and participants. I am honored to be at the rising to the challenge, leveraging youth talent for national and regional development youth forum. Today's discussion is particularly important to me as a promoter of youth development. As members of the UA family, it is important for us to bring together UA students and young people in the CARICOM area to discuss youth participation in CARICOM and the challenges of CARICOM and Caribbean regionalism. As we know, young people have a stake in the development of our region and their voices must be heard. In this statement, I will discuss the expectations of youth in Caribbean regionalism, their expectations of CARICOM as a regional project and actions that youth representatives can suggest enhancing participation and engagement in Caribbean regionalism and specifically in CARICOM's work. Now the expectations of the youth in the Carib Caribbean regionalism are in education, employment and social development. Young people in the Caribbean have high hopes for regional integration. We anticipate that our leaders will prioritize policies that boost regional infra infrastructure, expand young job and entrepreneurial possibilities, and expand cross-cultural education and understanding. To aid in environmental preservation, young people wish, to, wish for greater funding for cutting edge technology, renewable energy sources, and sustainable development techniques. Furthermore, young people anticipate that CARICOM will deal with issues, issues such, such as crime, violence, injustice, and prejudice that are important to them. When we look at youth expectations of CARICOM as a regional project in supporting their aspirations and professional goals, we must identify that the Caribbean youth see CARICOM as a crucial regional project that can radically alter the region and better the lives of its people. They wish for CARICOM to care more about them and their goals. 
The youth of CARICOM countries demand increased chances, higher in education, vocational training, gainful work, and business ownership. Crime, violence, and prejudice are all concerns that the people of the Caribbean are calling on CARICOM to do something about. Young people have high hopes CARICOM will work for equitable and sustainable growth. They want CARICOM's decision-making procedures to be more open, accountable, and comprehensive. Finally, youngsters have high hopes that CARICOM will work more closely with regional civil society organizations, youth groups, and other stakeholders. Now, these are some actions youth representatives can suggest to their peers to enhance participation and engagement in Caribbean regionalism and specifically in CARICOM's work. Young people should push for their involvement in policymaking and civic engagement at all governmental and societal levels. They may do this by forming youth-led groups, lobbying lawmakers, and engaging in debate and consultation on issues that are important to them. By working with other groups in the region, such as NGOs, which are nonprofit organizations, businesses, and educational institutions, young people can better the region. They may work on initiatives and programs that advance regional collaboration, integration, and development. For young people to actively contribute to regional development processes, they must acquire the knowledge and abilities necessary. And as my fellow panelists stated earlier in their presentation, education and training in the fields are important to regional development, such as economics, politics, the environment, and social justice can help them achieve their goals. Innovation and entrepreneurship may be encouraged in the Caribbean by encouraging young people to develop novel solutions to the region's problems. Additionally, they might back up environmental preservation and sustainable development programs. And we ask two, I will ask two questions in general. <laughs> How can Caribbean youth utilize technology and digital platforms to increase their participation in CARICOM and regional development processes? Let me answer. Young people may use social media, which is one of young people's favorite these days, to disseminate information, unite in action, and build a community around important causes and campaigns. Young people's thoughts and ideas may be communicated with policymakers and other stakeholders through digital technologies like online surveys and polls. The relevance of youth engagement in resolving regional concerns and difficulties may be highlighted through young people's creation and sharing of internet material. Youth regional, sorry, forgive me. Youth regional development may be aided by using online learning platforms to give training and educational materials to youth, to your youth. The next question is what strategies can be employed to ensure that the voices and opinions of young people are heard and considered in the decision-making processes of CARICOM. Young people should be included in meaningful discussions and consultations about topics that matter to them, giving them a voice in shaping policies and programs. Formalizing young people's input into policymaking through establishing youth advisory committees and youth parliaments is a useful strategy. Including young people in de delegations and other high level meetings is a great way to ensure their voices are heard and their experiences are considered. The Guild, for example, is, is an institution or a, is an institution <laughs> that mold young people to become leaders. And some move into politics. It's like, it seems to be like, you know, a given. <laughs> young people can be given the tools they need to participate in decision-making processes by providing them with, with training and support. In conclusion, young people in the Caribbean region have high expectations for regional, regional integration and development, and their perspectives must be considered as well as work towards a brighter future for our region. Together, we can make it happen. 
And I look forward to hearing the other perspectives of my fellow panelists and participants. So I am confident that our discussion today will be insightful and fruitful. And I thank you all for listening and for your time. It's a pleasure. I am indeed in so Thank you so much for those words, Ms. McCann. That was excellent. Um, I actually realized that in my excitement to, uh, when I was introduced, I didn't actually say it's on the program, but I should actually say explicitly for those of you that did not see the program, it's in the chat, by the way, for those of you that might, might have missed it. Uh, Ms. McCann um, now serves as the regional president of the Guild of Students for the Open Campus. All right. Um, I was really enthralled to hear what she said. Um, and it is very interesting that connection that you pointed out between the Guild of Students and uh, future political careers. Um, I'll leave it there, but that is very interesting that you point that out. Um, Mr. Morales Bowen, uh, over to you. Sorry, Mr. Morales Bowen, sorry. Uh, over to you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, it's, a, it's an honor to be here today to address the topic of young Caribbean people's expectations of Caribbean regionalism and CARICOM as a regional youth project. Uh, so firstly, let's, let's address the expectations of young Caribbean people about regionalism. The, the Caribbean is, is a unique and diverse area with many cultural, social, and economic differences. But yet still there is a common understanding among young people that regionalism is a necessary step towards sustainable development and achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so regionalism in the Caribbean is seen as an opportunity to increase economic growth, social inclusion, and political stability. It is viewed as, by the youth, as a platform for addressing the common challenges such as climate change, migration, and security issues. However, young people also have some expectations about the way regionalism should be implemented. Firstly, we expect a more decentralized approach to regionalism where each country's needs and priorities are considered in the decision-making process. Secondly, we expect more transparency and accountability in the management of the regional projects and funds. And thirdly, we expect more youth involvement in the design and implementation of regional initiatives. And so in examining the expectations of Caribbean people or young Caribbean people about CARICOM as this regional project, our expectations, as Christine said, are high, you know, given the organization's potential to create opportunities for professional development, to facilitate regional trade and investment, and to promote social and cultural exchange. And so young people believe that CARICOM can support our aspirations by providing more opportunities for education, for training, and for employment across the region. We also expect CARICOM to support entrepreneurship and, and innovation by creating a more enabling environment for business development and investment. However, as young people, we also do have some concerns about the effectiveness of CARICOM in achieving its goals. We believe the, the organization needs to be more responsive to the needs of young people and take a more strategic approach in its initiatives. There, there is the expectation of CARICOM that they be more proactive in their approach to engaging with youth, particularly through the use of digital platforms and social media. And so what actions would we suggest to CARICOM or what, what do we suggest they do to promote youth participation and engagement in Caribbean regionalism? Um, you know, firstly, I would say start by enhancing the current dedicated youth department that focuses on youth development and engagement. You know, if this, is a, this department is responsible for promoting youth involvement in activities, providing training and development opportunities and creating a platform of youth advocacy, for youth advocacy rather, then this is of the utmost importance. And secondly, I'd say youth perspectives 
should be meaningfully incorporated into the decision-making process. This could be achieved through the establishment of youth advisory groups, as Renee said, including young persons in committees such as steering committees, where we can then provide input into the regional policies and programs that are going to be implemented. And thirdly, I'd say CARICOM can and should leverage digital platforms and social media to engage with young people. And social media isn't just, you know, posting on, on the different platforms, but actual dedicated social media campaigns, online consultations, digital town hall meetings, events such as this. These platforms can be used and should be used to provide information about regional initiatives, create opportunities for feedback and input, and facilitate dialogue between young people and regional leaders. And I know I'm not just speaking for the KFL Guild, but the well, for the KFL Guild, but I'm I'm certainly sure that the guilds would all always be open to, to working with CARICOM if it means you know promoting their initiatives to students on campus, to students of the university, because the university represents a significant portion of our future leaders and future working persons in the in throughout the region. And so touching back from, from what CARICOM could do and what what actions I would say should the young persons themselves take in, in participating and engaging in, in specifically CARICOM's work or regionalism, naturally there are several actions that can be taken. Uh, firstly, I'd say, as with almost anything, education is important. Firstly, we should educate ourselves about the benefits of regionalism, the work of CARICOM, and this, this can be achieved through research, attending conferences, seminar, participation in the different forums. And secondly, we should get involved, get involved in national and regional youth organizations that work towards promoting integra regional integration and development. These organizations provide the opportunities for young people to develop leadership skills that advocate for their needs and, and priorities, as well as to just engage in different initiatives, be it nationally or regionally. Thirdly, what I would recommend to young people, take advantage of existing opportunities provided by CARICOM, such as you know, the CSME, the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors Program. These programs provide opportunities for young people to travel, study, and work across the region, as well as to engage with regional leaders and policymakers. And finally, I suggest that we use digital platforms and social media to engage with CARICOM and our leaders. You know, this includes things like following the CARICOM page, participating in online consultations when they come up, using different digital platforms to advocate for your needs and for priorities. And so I, I know time is of the essence, so I, I'll just conclude with a summary. As Christine said, we have high expectations of Caribbean regionalism and CARICOM, and we expect you know, a decentralized approach to regionalism. We want this transparency in the management, and we want more active youth involvement in the design and implementation of the various regional initiatives. To promote youth participation, CARICOM should increase the incorporation of youth perspectives into the decision-making process and leverage the various digital platforms to engage with young people. And finally, young persons can take several different actions to engage in Caribbean region regionalism and specifically CARICOM's week by educating yourself, getting involved, and you know, taking advantage of already existing opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'll go, I'm going straight on to Mr. Bisna, who I introduced earlier, um, the president of the Guild of Students of St. Augustine. Please, the floor is yours, Mr. Bisna. Oh, I'm not hearing him. Are you all hearing him? We're not hearing you. Okay, but yeah, it doesn't look like you're muted. So hold on, that's a simple technical one second. Say something else, Mr. Bisner. Okay, still not. 
Um, hmm. I wonder what that could be. Maybe meet and unmute yourself again, I guess. I'm not sure. Okay, now, you're, now you're muted and the camera's off. Should I come back in? Hear me? That's fine, Mr. Business. This is minor technical issue that we can solve. All right. I think he's just exited to come back in. Yeah. Uh, this is usually a, a good strategy. He's reconnecting. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Perfectly. That's I, excellent. I'm really sorry. I'm not sure what happened. Um, okay. Okay. Um, all protocols are saved. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to begin today by um, prefacing this conversation by saying that while we all play an integral role in the development of processes within our societies, I guess you can say as conduits of social change ourselves within the region, it is our responsibility to ensure that policymakers within the Caribbean community you know, create avenues that are conducive to the perpetuation of an enabling environment for our youth. And this is as a means of, you know, decisively channeling their perspectives and ideas into the decision-making processes that impact their lives. And I want us to continue along this conversation, noting a, key, a few key things. Firstly, um, that development has proven to occur in societies that develop and, and deploy their citizens in ways that foster and enhance productive potential. Um, you know, and just to talk a bit about this, in essence, it means investing in education and skills um, training and providing opportunities for entrepreneurs and innovation, as, as other panelists have mentioned. Um, and this is also creating an environment that supports growth of businesses and industries. When people have these skills and the knowledge that they need to succeed, they can create new products and services, start new businesses, and contribute to the economy in meaningful ways. Um, of course, by maximizing the potential of its people, an economy can become more competitive and innovative, um, which can lead to higher levels of economic growth and prosperity. Secondly, um, secondly I'm sorry, I want to quickly hop over to you know, the fact that there is an ex that there exist several issues which pose a potential to undermining youth talent um, and by extension development within the Caribbean region. Now, while the Caribbean region is home to a wealth of talented and skilled young people who have the potential to drive the region's development forward, it does face several challenges when it comes to harnessing and nurturing youth talent for development. Um, notably, one of these key challenges facing Caribbean youth is access to quality education and training. Um, while our region has definitely made notable progress in recent years, there are still significant gaps in education and training opportunities. Um, and we can see this particularly for disadvantaged youth. Um, you know, naturally, this in itself can limit their ability to develop the skills and knowledge necessary to contribute to the region's development, um, and even nationally here. Uh, perhaps another challenge as well that can be noted is the limited availability of employment opportunities, um, and this is particularly within certain sectors. Uh, this can make it more difficult for young persons to fully utilize their skills and talents, oftentimes leading to frustration, um, job insecurity, and underemployment. Of course, I, I also want to mention that despite these challenges, there are also many positive developments in the region, you know, when it comes to youth talent for development. Um, as we know, there are growing numbers of programs and initiatives aimed at providing education, training, and employment opportunities, um, you know, for young people. And this, there is also a growing recognition of the importance, you know, to advocate strongly for greater access to free movement uh, within the region and greater opportunities um, for those who cannot pursue, you know, traditional or conventional methods of of, um, of finding jobs, like through a university degree, for example. Um, of course, there is also the consideration of addressing, you know, the labor market and social challenges, which will which require considered effort from governments. It goes much beyond governments. It also includes employers and civil society organizations within the Caribbean. 
Um, and of course, you know, this could involve investing in education and skills training programs um, that aim to promote entrepreneurship and innovation and create policies that support the growth of businesses and industries in the region. Um, additionally, um, efforts to reduce gender-based discrimination and promote and the promotion of you know um, an inclusive employment practices practices um, could help create more opportunities opportunities as well for young people in the Caribbean. Lastly, I want to mention the fact that CARICOM was not originally designed to address labor market challenges, um, meaning that we must adapt in order to survive if we want to promote the effectiveness of, um, of the organization in a talent-driven economy. Um, so CARICOM was primarily designed as a regional economic integration and cooperation mechanism, and, itself, and in and of itself, it focuses on trade and economic development. While CARICOM has made some efforts to address labor market challenges in the region, um, such as through the development of regional labor laws, um, law standards and policies and effectiveness, um, in a talent-driven economy where skills and human capital are critical to economic growth and competitiveness, addressing labor market challenges is essential. Um, however, we have noted that in CARICOM, its, its institutional structure and government arrangements were not initially um, designed to address these challenges, which in itself can hinder its effectiveness in this area. Um, to address these issues, there have been you know, calls for CARICOM to focus more on a human development and capacity building, um, you know, including in the areas of education, skills training, workforce development. Um, and this could involve developing new policies and initiatives that promote skills development, entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, as well as strengthening the coordination and collaboration among regional institutions and stakeholders working in this area. Um, you know, in, in summary, I would say that while CARICOM was not originally designed to address labor market challenges, you know, there is growing recognition of the importance of human development and capacity building in a talent driven economy. And, you know, efforts are being made to strengthen CARICOM's effectiveness in this area. Um, Okay, uh, is, is it possible for me to have a time check? I don't know how much time I, I have right now. One minute, I was done with to tell you. Okay, no, um, one minute. Well okay. done. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, you know, lastly, that, you know, we, we often have, we oftentimes have this conversation about what youth representatives suggest, you know, to regional leaders in terms of what we want to see done in the Caribbean. And I would say that some suggestions would be definitely creating dedicated youth focused institutions, you know. We advocate for the creation of these institutions and other regional organizations to ensure that young people and their perspectives and their needs are better reflected in the region through policies and decision making. Um, you know, there is also the need for engaging young people in policy and development and implementation in general. Um, moreover, we can yeah, it can be suggested that we promote youth-led initiatives and projects. So there is a call for you know support of these projects that can contribute to regional development, um, such as entrepreneurship and social innovation programs. Um, perhaps one thing that I find most notable, or perhaps I can just say generally overall, um, in the Caribbean, there, we have emphasized that you know, there is a need for greater youth participation and engagement in regional development processes. Um, and it has provided several suggestions to regional leaders, and it, it all regards around you know, promoting engagement to ensure that young people's perspectives and needs are better reflected within policymaking and, and, uh, and decision making in general. Because ultimately, uh, young people are, are who these policies are impacting, it is who you know, these, our lives are dictated by it. And we have a right to having a say in terms of policies and agendas that will ultimately impact our lives as a region, as a nation, as a collective. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we have a number of questions that I'm just gonna dive right into. Thank you. Uh, to all of the youth representatives, thank you to the minister. But before uh, we dive into to give any thanks, uh, I want to get everybody involved in the conversation. We have just about 15, uh, at least after 12 minutes before I have to, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I'm going to give the vote, the vote of thanks at five to the hour. Um, so we have about at least 12 minutes to have a lively discussion, um, which is really, really important to me. I'm going to ask the questions that I saw in the chat earlier. 
please, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat. That would allow me to facilitate asking the question. Um, uh, there was one person, uh, I believe Kunik Panton, that raised a significant concern about employment um, in the in the Caribbean being a, a major challenge being faced by young people and how nepotism is actually undercutting the ability of young persons to, to get jobs. And like that, one of who on the panel wants to take a stab at, at addressing that and what do you think can be done about, about the, the word of nepotism? Um, in terms of employment, also I'm going to I'm just going to read out all the questions, and I'm just going to uh, allow members of the panel to to respond. Um, at least three of the questions at one time. Um, this is not a question as much as much as a statement. Um, Jia Lang said, "I think it is more important than ever to share knowledge and best practice without barriers that can be adapted to harness talent proactively in a level playing field." Um, Amanda Best Noel asked. How can we be innovative to promote sustainability for the region, especially in education? Um, uh, another comment by Amanda was that the Guild is the embryo, the Guild of Students, that is, of the University of West Indies, I, I imagine she's referring to. Um, but student associations and the whole, even for non uv institutions, uh, the, uh, is the embryo for the development of Caribbean leaders. We must invest in it. Um, and so we actually have three questions. So two statements and three questions. So the three questions, one is about nepotism and employment. Um, and one is about how, how can we be innovative to promote sustainability for the region, especially in education. And the final question from Camille Bacho is, how can I be a part of the youth movement? Which is a question I love. Um, so uh, who, what if uh, anyone, including Dr. James can, can please feel free to just put your hand up, any one of the panelists that is, to respond to any of the questions. Uh, it is, I, I'm not gonna call anybody in particular, but anyone of anyone who spoke, including uh, the Honorable Minister, if you'd like to speak as well, um, or if I think that one is particularly well suited for you, I, I, I'll, I'll point it to you, but does, does any one of the panelists want to respond to any of the three questions that we have so far? So, um, Karen, I would take the question, the last question, which is, so how can persons um, engage, or how can they get involved in doing youth work? The yeah, thing that we um, <laughs> So, you see, I would say uh, pretty much in terms of a person who are interested in getting involved in youth work, um, you can generally, um, there's various routes, um, there are different organizations at the community level. Um, if you are in the school or the university system, there are the clubs. Um, you can get involved in a club. You um, so they there are different levels in terms of which you can get involved. I would say just um take the leap and get involved. There are also notable organizations such as Rotarac, um, that does a lot of find your what I would say is first find your niche. Um, find what are you passionate about, what are you interested in, because that would drive your work because volunteerism is not necessarily the most easiest things at times. There are times when, you know, you may question, you know, why I get involved. So first, I would say, firstly, look at your life and your goals. Look at what you are passionate about. Once you're determining that, find an organization that aligns with your goals or what you are interested in or passionate about. It makes the work um, easier. Um, so... The, the, um, as I said before, you can get involved in village councils or community councils um, in that level. If you're interested in politics, you know, um, a lot of young persons tend to, like, you know, join organizations and they know they eventually want to get into politics. I would say just go straight for it. Um, join the political organization. They are youth arms. Um, that you can get involved in. Um, and, um, so there's um, the university. If you want to get involved in the clubs, there's the... Um, probably over 60. When I was at the Guild, there were like about 60 plus clubs. I'm not sure. Maybe Kyle can probably see how much there is now. Um, so there are different clubs, different that you can get involved in. If you want to get involved in national, on a national level, there's getting in contact with your national youth councils. Um, and then, you know, there are different ways. The Commonwealth also, let me just plug that in there. If you go to the Commonwealth Youth Council page for those persons who are interested in, you know, working with the Commonwealth and their networks, they have various networks, such as the Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors Network, different networks. They're actually making open calls right now for persons who may be interested in serving on that level. Um, so you can, um, those are just different levels. So there are opportunities um, on a national level, a community level, a school level. Um, you just um, first define what you want and get out of it and then, you know, take it from there. 
Definitely, definitely. I mean, I add that it's always easier to push or to stay a moving ship. So if you get started, it's easier to kind of get to where you want to be if you just get started. Um, it may not be a such thing. I don't know if there's such a thing as a perfect start, but getting started really helps. Um, not, oh, I thought uh, Miss Injago was going to say something. If not, oh, you will. You are okay. But by all means, by all means, Ms. Injago. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, taking on to the question about education and innovation, how can we be innovative in the area of education? So, in this context, innovation really means solving a problem in a new, simple way to promote equitable learning for all. So. What are the main problems in our educational system? Do we have many dropouts? Do we have a lot of people who are, have not found interest in secondary education and tertiary education? We have remarkable professionals, remarkable scholars. We have many of, of them in front of us right now. Many doctors, you know, many members of parliament. Uh, but how many people can actually say that education was the factor that provided them the motivation to pursue these things? Nine times out of 10, the environment in which this person is growing in is the one that defines their pursuits, their passions, and their thoughts about the future. Our educational system, especially in the secondary and primary levels, requires diversification and simplification in the sense that repeating the same exam five years after five years in the same exact order with the same exact questions does not promote creative thinking, does not promote problem solving, research skills, public speaking, real life necessities that you will make use of in university. Chances are, if you were great at researching and writing in secondary school, you will be great in college. But what about those who weren't? We are lacking inclusivity. We're thinking, with a mentality that says, if you're not doing great enough, then I guess you won't be the one of the future, but you are the youth of the future. So that is what I would say, diversify teaching, diversify the context of learning, syllabus, the thinking about how we learn in our youth or how we teach our youth. And lastly, let us properly acknowledge, highlight and compensate our teachers. They really are going through it and they give it all. <laughs> So they need to be appropriately compensated. Thank you. Amen. Well, well said. I'm, I'm not saying amen just because I'm a teacher. I'm saying for all teachers. I'm saying for all teachers. Um, Kyle, um, sorry, um, Mr. Moral de Bourne. You can, you can have yeah, a second question. Yeah, I can go. go um, just, I, I'm going to start by saying with respect to education specifically, there's a there's a saying I saw recently, can't remember who to, to um give credits to, but it, it goes something like you can't memorize your way out of a climate crisis. You can't memorize your way out of you know the different situations and conflicts that we find ourselves in, you know, as people, as a region, as as citizens of, of the global society. And so the first step or the first, the more, one of the most important things is to evaluate what it is, is the focus of education, because it, it shouldn't be memorizing because that isn't what is going to help us to move forward, help us to innovate. You know, it's important that we stress the, the importance of things such as critical thinking, such as adopting a, a open mindset in terms of when looking to solutions, and being open to suggestions from, from other fields. And so I'll start by saying, you know, a few approaches that could be taken is, you know, one, a, a multidisciplinary approach because sustainability issues are complex and interdisciplinary. It, it, it's an economist by himself is not going to solve the issue. Uh, a physicist by himself or herself is not going to solve the issue you need a you need to ad adopt a, a multidisciplinary approach and help these persons think together in order to develop solutions that could help you know promote sustainability and come up with you know the the solutions to these problems uh i'll go further by just saying use technology the, the technology exists and technology is constantly advancing 
it, it doesn't make sense to stand back and you know be afraid of the technology when it exists and when it is already there and moving forward. What you should do is try to, to make use of it, try to incorporate it into what you are doing and, and your experience and in your understanding of complex you know concepts. Uh, I'll say it's, it's extremely important also to foster partnerships at, at all levels, at a community level, at a, a regional level, also going, going wider into the, the global setting because, you know, these, these issues all, even though we, we like to think there's an objective answer, you know, decision-making at a, a regional or global level, it, it, it includes and incorporates politics. It includes negotiation and an important factor, important part of all these things is to ensuring that you have partners, people that you could support or could support and that will support you when it is you need to try to get decisions made, when it is you need to push for a certain decision to be made on a, on a wider context. Um, I also say going back to education, emphasize experiential learning because humans, we we can read and understand and and. and you know, for the most part, digest knowledge, but through experience, most of us have a better ability to, to understand stuff. It, it, it gives you a sort of responsibility and stewardship when you are there hands-on and are part of the experience. It's things such as community service, you know, outdoor education, it could help students, it could help persons understand, you know, sustainability issues in a in a practical and meaningful way and just going back to the, the first question that Kendall kind of started to address uh it's really important to not think about it as how how do I get involved it's not just I'm trying to get involved yes you want to get involved but think about what is your interest and think about where you can add some sort of value or give your personal you know help that organization move forward so if you're interested in you know economic economics you could go be a part of a, 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 a i think in saint augustine is the economic society if it is you interested in you know the environment i'm sure there's probably an environmental club if you wherever your interest lies you know try to be a part of that type of organization and then while look into that type of organization, look within yourself and see what am I good at? What is my skills? And so if I want to be a part of, I'm going to say economics again, I want to be a part of the economics association, but I'm not an economist, but I'm good at, you know, public relations and communications. And I could be a part of this organization and help them with their communication and with their public relations and help address a very pertinent and important issue. So as I say, think about what you're interested in. Think about, you know, maybe something that you want to see put forward, something developed, and then think about where and how you can add. Because if I can add to an organization, if you can add to an organization and you go to the organization and say, you know, I want to help, nobody's going to tell you no. Nobody's going to say, okay, now, nah, we, we, don't, we don't need somebody to help with public relations, even though we can't do it. You go, offer yourself up, and, you know, most likely they take you on board. And you as you start you get better because, you know, being a part of a, a, a youth organization, taking a role as a youth leader, it is, it involves, you know, organization and and, and in mentoring, advocacy. And so you can't start mentoring if you haven't, you know, gone through and tried to experience things. So start, get involved. And as you build up experience, encourage others and, you know, become a leader in the process. Awesome, 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 awesome. Loving this. Um, panelists, there, there, there may be one question there in the chat that I want you guys to, to touch on. There was a question about nepotism because Mr. Bisnath mentioned the labor market. So I'm going to throw it your way and then I will do the vote of stance because we are officially out of time. But I'm going to ask you to the panelists to respond to particularly Mr. Vincent, that question and Ms. Um, McCann, Mrs. McCann. If you all can respond to that question in the chat for Ms. Panton, that would be amazing. Thank you so very much. Mr. Bisnat, over to you um, before I do the vote of thanks. Oh, Ms. James. Uh, thank you so very much. Now, I think it's important when considering, I, I think firstly we can, we can all agree that definitely, um, you know, this is a significant challenge that is faced by a lot of Caribbean people. 
Um, yeah, so they say so young people as well, but I think the issue of nepotism is very widespread and pervasive in nature. And initially, at, at the beginning of this conversation, I would have mentioned that when you speak about social, when you speak of, about development, you know, there are various forms of development, social, political, etc. cetera. Um, but it is important to conceptualize that each individual person is so important in that general process. We all play, we not only have an individual responsibility to uphold and maintain, um, you know, norms that are ideal um, and just, um, you know, so these, these speak to social justice and, and equity and inclusivity. Um, but also it is, it is also equally our responsibility to advocate and to, which is why we want to, we seek to empower the voices of you, because if, if this is an issue that you are experiencing and then you ventilate that issue, naturally there should be recourse in, in addressing that issue. Um, so I would say that in moving forward, since this is such a prolific issue, it is important that youth um, and youth organizations and um, rather any entity that is used to channel the, the voices and opinions of youth be used to do so in a way that raises awareness of the issue so that it can be addressed in a manner that is I would say long-term beneficially. So I'm talking about not band-aid fixes, but you know, we want to see legislative, legislative reform in terms of ensuring that you know, these things are, and people are held accountable because ultimately you cannot expect to receive benefits from um, you know, young people in this instance if they are barred from access, if you choose selectively and cherry pick who you want to be in these situations, regardless of merit, regardless of one's ability to produce tangible outcomes. Um, I don't think it's a feasible, um, it's something that will work out well for us. Um, but yes, I, so to keep it short, I would say that that is my contribution in relation to that question. I think I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, there was one other question I was going to ask. Um, but I I think I'm out of time. Uh, Honorable, Ms. Honorable Minister James, are you here? You're back. I thought I lost you for a minute. You dropped yeah. out. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask some of the questions that were posed earlier, but I think the panelists, um, they, they um, sufficiently covered it. Um, but a question was directed to me um, yes. in particular as to how, how had the journey been for me and whether or not I was discouraged. Um, so I felt propelled to give a response to that. And I would say that indeed there were times when I, I faced um, discouragement from individuals who believe that pursuing a career in politics, especially at a young age, was an unwise decision. And um, I think it, it it hit home because my parents, they were, they were one of those people or persons who uh -huh. discouraged me as well. Because here you have a, a teenager just coming out of um, college and come to tell you that she wants to get involved in politics. And I believe they, they because of the, the, their nurture and because they were so protective and, and, and they understand the political dynamic um, through the victimization, discrimination that can occur if you, if you decide to choose a political party over the other, um, they also discouraged me. But um, many persons, they, they argue that I was too young, I was inexperienced, or that politics was a field tainted by corruption and cynicism, you know. And so, despite these setbacks, I I think I remain steadfast in my commitment to making a difference for my community. And even if it meant standing up, standing up to and standing against my parents' will for me, <laughs> at that time I was just shy of two months, um, being 18 years. And so I felt as though I was an adult to make a, a conscious decision for myself. And I knew what I wanted and how I envisioned um, Grenada to be in for us young people. You know, and um, to answer the second part of the question as to how did I respond, I, I honestly chose to see um, these challenges as opportunities to grow, to learn and to prove that young people, we do have the power to bring about positive change. And I reminded myself of the immense potential that we as the youth hold in our hands. And I listened to something that I think most times when when young people fail or when young people's backslide is because of um then they're not being able to to actively listen 
And so listening is important. I learned and I, I engaged in constructive conversations that, you know, broaden my understanding of the issues that matters mattered most to our people. Um, I think one of the, the experiences that I can share with you in terms of um, a particular setback, for me, it would have been um, the political journey, the journey towards our general elections and having to hear from persons who are political gurus um, downplay the efforts of our, your, our young people. I am the youngest person who ran, contested a seat for my party. And there were other young persons under 30, um, under 35 as well, who ran and, and they were successful in winning their respective constituency seat. But to hear from past leaders and so who have been there for umpteen years, even more than the amount of years that we have, um, you know, say such um, disgraceful and hurtful things about our, our participation instead of, you know, trying to encourage us, despite we are not, we, we, we don't have that same party um, political ideologies, but at the same time showing that, you know, you have been there as a leader, you, you, you want to encourage young persons to get involved into the leadership um, realm of politics at a young age and so for me one of the biggest setbacks would have been um being baffled by the fact that political gurus in the past political leaders prime ministers in the past of our country would have come condemned con condemned us so so terribly um in public right and so i would say my advice to others who might face similar discouragement is to believe in your abilities and your vision that's the first and foremost um, step that you can take, right? Embrace your passion. And I think one of the panelists um, expounded on that earlier in, in a, a very substantive way. You just have to get right into it. Join the political parties. Don't follow lines that perhaps mommy or daddy or, or a, a sibling or a guardian of yours followed, but objectively review, view, and question some of the policies, some of the, some of the programs, the ideologies of these political parties within your countries and see which one best fits the need for us now, for our young people to develop, for them to have that space so that we can develop in this 21st century, right? Um, I would say embrace your passion, your resilience, and the unique perspective that, that you or we bring as young persons. Uh, surround yourself with mentors and allies who support your aspirations. It's, it's key, and that is how I am able to survive and I have been able to, to reach that pinnacle in where I have, I have reached. And thank God I'm humbled by that, you know? And never lose sight of the values and, and principles that guide you, or the morals that you, you grew up with, the foundationals, right? And I would conclude by saying that as a senior government minister under the age of 25, I feel humbled and I feel honored. And the journey was not without its challenges, but through pers perseverance, um, determination, and the support of those who believed in me, I have been able to rise above the ob obstacles and contribute to the betterment of, of, of my society. And if I can do it in Grenada, what is stopping you from doing it? Yes? <laughs> so that would be my contribution and i also wanted to make a quick feedback um i think it was the first question forgive me for not remembering who it came from regarding um i think it was the sustainability of um the challenges or the hurdles in employment in in due to nepotism and i would say that um, it is disheartening that in this era of boundless opportunities and potential that um, the dreams and aspirations of our youth are sometimes being stifled by nepotism. And I believe that our region's progress and prosperity lies in the collective strength of our young minds. Um, and perhaps I could go on further to say that it is our duty to ensure that every voice is heard and given a fair chance to flourish. And if we are honest about this discussion today, and if we are honest about our view of, of the car of CARICOM, um, addressing nepotism is a complex and a very sensitive issue. 
but we must be determined to take actionable steps to ensure that uh, the playing field is leveled for our young talents. And we must work closely with stakeholders, including governments, including the private sectors and other educational institutions um, to establish some of the policies and practices that promote um, meritocracy and inclusivity. So that would be my contributions with regards to some of the questions that was posed earlier on. So thank you. Thank you so very, very, very much. And what an inspirational note to end um, this day on. I, I already see in the um, contributions in the chat, um, the, the thankfulness in the chat for that, last, particularly for that last contribution. Please, um, ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for members of the panel and the honorable minister um, who showed up today um, and really contributed uh, excellently to, to the discussion. Um, I particularly liked uh, how the panel was closed off just now in terms of people will discourage you. You know, people would encourage you to participation, but when they find out you're going to run against them for an election, an election they be the first to talk about your inexperience. You know, um, so definitely the very real words of the minister um, were very, very heartening. I think it was, it was a fitting note for me to now begin the vote of thanks. Um, I want to say, of course, thank you to the Honorable uh, Deacon uh, Ms. Thomas Mitchell, Prime Minister of Grenada, uh, for his support of this initiative. Um, I want to say thank you to Ms. Julieta, um, sorry, Julia um, Frederick Williams, um, Secretary to the Minister, and Ms. Mrs. Marina. Jasami, who's the permanent secretary of the, in the Ministry of Climate Resilience, the Environment and Renewable, and Renewable Energy in Jamaica as well. Um, I also want to say a thank you to Ms. Carolyn McQuilkin, um, permanent secretary, uh, acting permanent secretary, uh, with respect to the Ministry of National Security, um, Home Affairs, Information and Disaster Management. All right. Um, and attached, of course, to the Ministry of National Security, Home Affairs and Public Administration, Information and Disaster Management. Uh, in addition, I want to say thanks to the uh, Ms. Felicia Adams, the Executive Secretary, Office of the Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM. And I want to say a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Armstrong Alexis, the Deputy Secretary General of the CARICOM Secretariat. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as well in saying a heartfelt thanks to all of our speakers here today, the Honorable uh, Ms. Corrine uh, James, Minister for Climate Resilience, the Environment and Renewable Energy in Grenada. Thank you to Ms. Renny Atwell, Dean Cargum Youth Ambassadors, Mr. Kendall Vincent, the Chairperson of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council, Mr. Ozaze Moral Moraldo Bowen, the President of the UE Capel Guild of Students, Mrs. Christine McKean, the regional president of the Open Campus Guild of Students, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sorry, Ms. Camila Indriago, the president uh, of the UV St. Augustine and Mother UN, UN Club, and Mr. Kyle Bisnard, the acting president, UV uh, Guild of Students. Uh, always, I, I, given that we are uh, representing the Institute of International Relations, I also have to say, um, Thank you to everyone in the audience that showed up, in particular members of the diplomatic community, active and recently retired in that, yeah, and in that regard, I have to uh, as well say uh, thanks to former ambassador, um, uh, Lancelot Kaui, former ambassador to Cuba, who has joined us live from the Institute. Thank you very much for joining us. And of course, for the support of the Marketing and Communications Department at the University of Indies. For, 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 for writing us together and making sure that uh, the connection didn't drop and sending us all the links so that everything would run smoothly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, please feel free please to stay in touch. You can find me, Karen, as at, at LinkedIn. Most of the participants here can easily be found on LinkedIn if you type in their, their names. Um, Ms. Njiago put all of her details in the chat as well for you to find her. Um, I'm going to put in the chat now. Um, I, I put my IG there, but you can also find me on LinkedIn, you can, and I want to encourage all of us to stay in touch. Uh, this has been CARICOM at 50. Really looking forward to another 50 years, but really thinking very deeply 
about how we are going to leverage youth talent towards national and regional development. Happy anniversary to CARICOM and a pleasant day to all of you. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody.